Well, uh, wow, I'm excited today. We're, uh, we're back again with our Do Good Better uh, live stream sessions, and I'm very excited to be able to introduce uh, really someone I've learned a lot from throughout my, uh, my experience as a nonprofit leader, and it's uh, Professor Phil, Philip Simon who is from Quinnipiac University. He, uh, and I'd worked with him when he was at Yale, a real expert in online education and distance learning and adult learning techniques. And uh, I've worked with uh, Professor Simon on building uh, our own learning management systems and, uh, but also using out of the box systems uh, to really provide online training for different types of populations. And so very excited to introduce uh, Professor Simon, who's going to talk a little bit about online training and education, best practices, and uh, really every nonprofit will probably need to lean on some sort of online training, education, if it's with board members, if it's with your uh, right. outward clients, or if it's with the internal uh, team building activities. Right. So you're welcome. Thanks, Scott. Good to see you today. So, you know, I don't know if you want to get started and just give us uh, kind of a little bit of a background and, and some of the concepts that you uh, address as you're build, helping organizations build online educational uh, sure. uh, opportunities. You might want to compare kind of the online training that a university might do compared to maybe what an organizational right. online right. training. Right, right, right. Sure. Well, yeah, there is, there is lots of ways to reach and train and teach and inform an audience using the sort of these online teaching tools. At a university like Quinnipiac, we use an enterprise-wide tool called Blackboard. And, and that's useful because one, it's secure for, for uh, FERPA requirements in terms of student privacy. We can grade in it, we can do assignments in it, it's linked to our registration system. Um, so that would be way beyond anything that uh, a, a nonprofit needs to use unless you were huge, huge and plan to run sort of a, in a sense, a four credit kind of operation. Um, many other institutions and, and smaller organizations are using other off the shelf kind of tools like Teachable or Talent LMS to put their knowledge basically online. Um, those two platforms and others have been very more and more popular in the last several years as a lot of individuals discover that they have a skill set that they think might be useful to other people. They put the course online, they're very easy to use, and they sell them. And they actually, it's a way of generating some, some income and revenue. Um, it's, uh, I think for nonprofits, there's a lot of ways to think about um, how to educate, train, inform people who, who are your audience. It depends who the audience is, of course. But if a nonprofit thinks about any group of people that they've had to impart knowledge to, However, they've done that before. There's probably a solution there for them to do that online, um, from something as simple as hope, uh, holding a Zoom meeting, it can be very effective, to getting very, very um, uh, sophisticated with an online platform where you have multiple courses, and courses have units, and you can score them. And people can get certificates and go the other direction in terms of very sophisticated system, which you could charge for or make free, depending on who your audience is. So that's sort of the, the rough overview of what's happening. Um, but what is, it, you know, before the, the coronavirus crisis, everyone knew that online training and education was certainly possible and done and sort of becoming acceptable as a way to, to teach. Um, what we're finding now is that it's become, and then it was sort of considered optional. It was a nice thing to be able to do. My master's program at Quinnipiac was offered online, but undergraduates were not given much opportunity to do online courses. Um, but now with this crisis, we don't have any other option. If you want to teach, you want to inform, this is how you have to do it. So it's a completely new paradigm of how what was sort of optional now is a necessity. And so I think the outcome of this, when we all, when we eventually go back to more normal kinds of um, uh, public lives and lives in general in terms of interacting with people for real is that people are going to realize, wow, this is a useful tool to use. I don't always have to have pe meet people in a particular place. They don't have to come to me. I, maybe I can reach a broader audience because I don't have to set up a place to meet. And um, so I think this is going to be more generalized usage of these tools, even after this all subsides, because we've all learned how to use it because we didn't have any choice. 
So let me, let me ask you a quick question. So mm -hmm. I, I know as you and I have worked in the past, um, one of the um, limitations I, I've seen in these distance learning platforms is uh, seat capacity. How many mm -hmm. people in your audience can you have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about different options and how to sure. maybe work around that? Sure. Uh, Zoom might have limitations in how many people can, can participate, right. but there might be right. some other options. Right. Well, I think the first thing to do is, is to ask how big is your audience or potential audience? Uh, you know, in the, about 10 years ago, there was this whole movement called MOOCs, which is massive online uh, courses where someone would put up some body of uh, instruction and make it available to the world. And the idea is that thousands, literally thousands of people could take this and get credits for it. Um, there'd be sort of proctors of people who would sort of lead discussions here and there. Um, I think what it did is develop a lot of good tools, but I think the idea that thousands of people would take courses all at once didn't quite succeed in the way people expected as a business model. Um, so it depends how big your audience is and what you want to say. So see capacity, um, and, and you don't think of it any differently than if you're running a real class. Um, if you had, if you're going to do some instruction and you said, well, you would first thing you think, well, how many people can we serve in a class? Well, I think reasonably I could teach 15 people at a time. Okay, so you teach 15 people at a time. That doesn't change. If you think you could teach 40 people at a time, you teach 40 people at a time. Any of these tools can adapt to that size. If you think, well, I've got something maybe a thousand people might want, then you maybe are thinking about a model which is not instructor led, but which is self paced, which is where rather than instructor leading the, <clears throat> the interaction, the person goes in the course and goes through on their own, they interact with the system. And then you could have any unlimited number of students depending on the capacity of your system and to support it. But if you feel it's, if it needs to be instructor led instruction where the real value is having me in the room with the people, explaining what to do, how to do the concepts of theories, looking at the assignments, then you go to instructor led model, which means you could do just in Zoom uh, or you, other systems where you interact either synchronously or asynchronously. And let me right. define those two terms because those are very important. Thank you. Synchronous, you can think of as just like a, a, a real classroom like we all went to. You meet once a week, twice a week, three times a week, or daily if you're in elementary school with a teacher. You come in and at that time, you meet, do instructional material. Then you go and do homework and stuff and come back and meet at that time again to do more work. And so that's synchronous because the students and the teachers are synchronized in terms of their activities. Asynchronous means that the teacher gives a body of work for the students to do. The students do it whenever they want. And the instructor responds, grades, has a discussion with them whenever they want. Usually it's within a time period. You could say, okay, the next week, here's what we're going to do. So it's asynchronous, meaning that the student-teacher activity does not happen in sync. It happens off sync at any time that they want. Um, online instruction, for at least in the college level, up till a couple of years ago, probably because of the advent of Zoom, uh, was mainly asynchronous. Um, and that's why I've been teaching online college courses since 2004, and it always was. Because one, there wasn't really a good tool to do synchronized learning. Where could I meet online with everyone all at once? Uh, and that works fine. Asynchronous can be very effective, and the instructor follows good best practices, can be worked very, very well. But in the last several years, I've actually doing sort of a hybrid where I'll have my students come meet in the Zoom meeting once a week. It's not required. I record the meeting for those who can't be there. So I get the best of both worlds in terms of being able to see them, interact, uh, have a sort of voice discussion as opposed to a threaded discussion in text, um, and that can work. But getting back to your original question about the number of capacity, um, you don't, don't think about what the system can support. Think about what you can support and what makes sense for what you want to do. And then you find the system or the system or the technique that works for you to support that size group and asking some of these questions. Is instructor-led? Is it self-paced? Is it asynchronous? Is it synchronous? And you can go from there. Great. Let's talk a little bit about adult learning styles and mm -hmm. attention spans. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
and you and I have had these conversations before. What what is a best practice when you're trying to develop online training, and, and how can you best keep a learner engaged uh, without overwhelming them or right. losing them? Well, so like any body of information that you want to impart someone, this is true for website as well, and it's true for channel surfing on the TV. How invested is that person in getting that information and knowledge? So if they, if they have to get the information in order to conduct their job or to do something that's really important to them, then they're, they're going to pay more attention and be more invested. You, you, you'll hold them better that way. If it's optional, if it's just pure entertainment, then the entertainment value, the production value has to be really, really high. So you have to keep that in mind. So, but that doesn't mean if it's absolutely essential for the person to get this knowledge that you sort of don't have to take care to make it a good, uh, a, a good experience because obviously, even if they absolutely have to get the information, retention is important. So really good learning techniques. Online, uh, my experience, there's some things to do is that you sort of chunk the material. You don't, let's say you had 40 minutes, you're going to do a video, and we do this a lot. You're going to do a video recording demonstrating a technique, uh, let's see, or an approach or a theory or whatever. It's best to break that into smaller five or 10 minute videos broken down by subtopics. Okay. Um, this day and age, as you know, with social media, people, if they say, will drift away from a YouTube video within 10 seconds, five seconds, if they don't find it interesting, and they won't watch it more than two or three minutes. Although there is trends towards longer form kinds of social media video, and obviously we watch a movie or a Netflix show on TV for 40, 50 minutes an hour because it's engaging, we wanna watch. Anyways, back to a course, break it down to small subjects, small topics uh, that they can watch and, and, and ingest, then ask them questions, engage in discussion about what you did. Um, it's like teaching any good course. If you're in a classroom and you showed a video to the class at the beginning, you don't say goodbye class, thanks for watching, you have a discussion. What do we cover? What happened there? What are some interesting things to talk about? Maybe you could do a quiz about it. So. It's not that different, you know, the, the, the techniques we use and how we engage are different, but the basic pedagogic theories don't go away just because it's online. In fact, they're probably more important because it is online. Um, you don't have things like body language I and mean, you can't see if the students in back is like this because they're not interested or they're drifting off. Part of a problem in classrooms now is everyone has their laptop open, who knows what they're doing. That's a, now that's a problem online because like people watching this right now or listening to it could be doing who knows what. They're out shopping, they're looking. We have no idea. At least in a real classroom, you have know, some sense of people are, are there. So that's another challenge of how you know people are engaged uh, online. That's probably one of the biggest challenges, especially when it's synchronous, uh, kind of like this, where you're, you're peering together in a classroom and, but you have no idea if they're actually watching or listening, even though their little picture is up there. Let's talk about some evaluation techniques. What are some great best practices on how to evaluate learners after they've watched a video, after they've taken a class, uh, to, to really measure what they've gained from that experience? Well, one thing about evaluation techniques is that you realize that's a learn teaching opportunity. Don't assume that you're just gauging uh, retention or they have to get a score in order to pass. You can ask follow-up questions that reinforce some of the key points that were in a video or a demonstration, for instance. Um, you can do multiple choice questions. A lot of these platforms, you can do free text answers to, and you, and you write the questions in a way which get them to think about what they just saw um, and get them to think about maybe in a different or a new way. Certainly a discussion in the thread, either a live one with the students in the room with a Zoom or a threaded discussion using a discussion board can work as well. Um, and based on that, you now evaluation is tricky because you very you know we grew up always getting a grade and a score, and a lot of people are students are stuck on I want to get that A. What do I have to do to get the A? And I tend to want to tell people don't worry about the grade, worry about what you're learning, and the grade will follow appropriately. But, you know, 12 or years of, of 
grade, middle, and high school uh, and a, a huge focus on metrics, it's hard to break that, um, that habit of wanting to, to focus on what you have to do to get the grade. Um, I don't suggest you try to break that in this case, but just do good teaching in terms of uh, uh, pro good prompts in terms of what you're talking about, evaluating, responding, uh, always responding to students, even if it's a little bit so they know you're listening and looking, or all ways to reinforce the learning. And evaluation will come, you can look at it qualitatively in terms of the nature of the responses and the prompts and what people respond text-wise. And quantitatively, you can do quizzes here and there, as long as they're good quizzes uh, and they're done well and they reinforce the learning and it's not all they do. You want a balance of these different techniques that you then can evaluate to see how well you're performing. Online testing is interesting, because, or any testing for that matter, but online testing that's normalized over a large group means that you can really evaluate your, your questions and your, your teaching based on responses over a whole group. So if you see that in an answer to a particular question, everyone's getting it wrong, that means then there's something wrong with the question or the teaching at that point. Right. That's a good way. So evaluation isn't so much about the learner. It's also evaluating how well is the course performing in terms of the objectives and the key objectives, outcomes that you want to get from the course. And getting that feedback is two ways. And even doing an evaluation with the students afterwards about how they think it went in terms of uh, helping you improve the teaching. Great, great. So uh, before we uh, started the uh, live stream, we were talking a little bit about how um, nonprofits and other organizations who have not done online training, distance learning uh, approaches might have to adopt it, especially as we approach the summer. We were talking about mm -hmm. summer camps, overnight mm -hmm. camps. Right. Uh, groups that have never really used this technique. So I right. thought maybe we could just go through a little bit of a case study of mm -hmm. how, you know, how do we get them started? Let's take a, a day camp, a YMCA mm -hmm. day camp in a local right. Uh, right. town, anywhere in this country. Right. What are some of the steps they would first have to take and, and, and right. progress to put something online that's never been online before? Right, right. And, and I, come on, I tell you, as I mentioned earlier, if we go into the summer or it's especially well, we will in many parts of the country or the world for the matter, not be able to do the normal things we do in summer, at least in this country, because summer is such a big deal. Imagine no day camps, no overnight camps, no swimming, no playgrounds, no miniature golf, no restaurants, no movies, no going to friend's house. I mean, it's, it, if the parents think they had it hard now, at least the kids are engaged in learning in school. Um, I think they're going to be desperate for looking for activities. So if a nonprofit has something they've offered to um, school-age uh, kids, um, then think about, well, first question, can it be done at home? It doesn't require going anywhere or in the backyard, for instance. That's key. So let's say you um, had a theater arts program. And part of it was to do um, improv. You could do an improv class on Zoom. That'd be really kind of fun, actually, where you know, you'd have whatever size group you want on Zoom, 10 or 15 people and a leader. And you could, have, you could improv either individually or in groups. You can do breakout groups where um, you could break out a small group of three, four, uh, kids and they go off and they have to come up with an improv and come back and show it or whatever. So, that one first requirement, they don't have to go anywhere to do it. Two, it can be done in the context of a, of a live meeting and it's fun. It can be made a lot of fun. Um, I was going to design, I was designing a photo um, camp where um, I would meet with the students from nine to 10 in the morning. We'd go over the, the day's activities. Um, then maybe from 10 to one, they would go out and shoot get their photographs, load them up, and then at one, we'd review what they did. Then I would do a lesson on how to use Photoshop on some of those photographs or whatever. they go back and work on them from two to five or whatever. The next morning, we would do that again and do it for five days or two weeks. Now, the challenge there is what, can I, what photography can I teach in the home when they can't go anywhere or outside? There's lots of things, small photography, studio portraits, candid portraits, what's my life in my house under this crisis, your pet. So there's a lot of things you could do. So that's another example. Um, any arts and crafts thing? 
for sure. If we're assuming they can get the materials to do a drawing, you could do drawing stuff. Um, there's lots of activities I think that are fun to do in the summer, which are led by a counselor. If you think about it, um, would be a great opportunity. It's not hard to do. You don't need a lot of prep, really. If someone's good at teaching drawing or theater arts, okay, just gonna do it in a Zoom thing. And then you have to adapt your style and what you do and what people can do. And being able to share screens would be fun. You could, could, could do a drawing and share the screen and stuff. And then you could, the teacher could annotate it using, so there's a lot of neat synchronous activities you could do with kids online during the summer. Set up these camps, uh, these virtual uh, camps and keep them fun, because that's what camp's supposed to be, right? Right, So right. Yeah. And then how could you encourage, let's say, learners to interact with each other, as if not just the uh, interaction with the instructor, but work, you know, you talked about the improv and breaking them into small right. groups. Right. You know, let's talk a little bit about that. How can they interact? Yeah, so that's always been a, a challenge in online learning, is how to get the students to work with each other. Um, you know, in college level, even high school and, and younger, you do you, the idea of doing group work where you give a small subset of students, three or four students, a project they have to do together, which really teaches teamwork, um, delegating activities, responsibility, leadership, all kinds of things. Online, they're hard to do group work because invariably you get the slacker, someone who's not going to pick do their part. Invariably, you're going to get the leader who thinks they have all the answers. I'm going to tell everyone else what to do and then all in between. So I found group work to be a challenge and could be done. Um, but independent of that, if you get them to talk about a topic together rather than have to come up with something at the end, put them into small groups and say, here's the topic, three or four of you go off and spend 15, 20 minutes talking about it. Someone come back and report what you discovered what you talked about, what your consensus is. That's better because it's not about producing a deliverable, like in group work project where they could do where they do a, have to write something or create something together. It's more about to report back how you feel about that. And so also when you're reporting back, it's reporting back different opinions from the group. It's not that you need to come up with a consensus. Like when you do group, group work project, well, the group's responsible for one project. I've had groups would split up because they couldn't decide on doing it. They said, well, those two want to do that and these two want to do that thing. So we just split it up into two projects. Well, in group discussion, it does, you can have four or five opinions. The idea is you report back to the rest of the class what those opinions were. And if there was consensus, fine. If there was different opinions. So that's the way you can get them engaged. Um, and I think people are more likely to talk in a smaller group. Some people don't like talking in a, a, large, a larger crowd, maybe two or three, four people. One thing to keep in mind online teaching, and which maybe is especially now with all our undergraduates like a Quinnipiac who are all having to go online all of a sudden, is to identify those who are struggling with it, uh, who don't take part or aren't contributing, and just check, you know, check in with them individually. How's it going? Something not working? Is it a technical problem? Um, you know, it with, obviously with the virus crisis, there's a lot of things people are challenged with that either they might not want to admit or feel they should be able to get through it. Uh, so it's important to reach it out to them individually. And I don't pry into their individual personal lives. I'll just say, is there something interfering with the ability to take this course to be a student? Right. I'm not saying they have to know, if they want to offer, that's fine. If they say yes, they said, fine, okay, let's figure out how we can work around it. Maybe, you know, do the work later, whatever. Um, but it's important to check with people in this context. Um, if you're going to offer an online instruction and you get and like a parent signs up someone, a kid, and that kid is just like not showing up, I would tell the parents ahead of time, getting back to the, you know, um, uh, summer camps, mm -hmm. make sure this, the parents know what you're planning to do. Like my photo course, I'd have to tell the parents, the students might start looking, dragging lights from around the house because I told them to do some DIY lighting. Uh -huh. yeah. So when the dragon lights from around, that's what's going, just so they know what to expect. So I think do you need to have a communication with the parent because obviously they're minors and they, I think the parent has to consent to them taking this. And part of that has to be, what are the, what are you going to be doing? So they have expectations. So if the, if the kid says, Oh, I'm going down to the park to take some pictures. Uh, yeah, but that's not in that curriculum where you're making that up. Right. Cause then it's important to, for the, for, for the parents to know what's expected. 
Great. So, so let's uh, do a little brain dump on me and just throw me all resources that you would recommend. Um, you know, again, we're, we're, I'm a summer camp. I haven't done um, any um, online training courses before. Just, you know, give me a brain dump of some great resources to start looking at, you know, now because, you know, summer is approaching and I need to get prepared. Right. Right. So in general, for any nonprofit who wants to do any kind of instruction, I would say a platform like Talent LMS or Teachable are good places to start. They're very affordable. Um, and so that's a place to start. Um, you could use for a camp, for, for kids in camp, it's really just getting familiar probably with Zoom. But I think about a camp that has to be that asynchronous presence with you. Um, it wouldn't be enough just to send some kids some activities. They need the daily counselor, making a fun, coaching, having jokes, who's in the camp. Get, you know, the kids get to know each other. So that's probably just getting used to Zoom and coming up with uh, a, a daily plan. Come up with a daily course plan is, is for lack of a better um, way to describe it, what you plan to do. Um, you know, think about the basic, well, put it this way, if you were planning your own summer plan, um, activity that was going to be in person, nothing's different. Like I said earlier, how many people can I do recently? What's the cost going to be? What are the activities? What's our daily schedule like? Um, what happens at the end? I was going to have like a Zoom meeting, invite all the parents and friends at the end for the photo class and say, hey, let's show everyone the work. Like, you know, have some sort of celebration at the end in terms of what everyone accomplished. Um, you're just transferring what you would do into a virtual environment. And then I have to think about now what's possible in a virtual environment. Well, two people being together is not possible. So the idea of you know, getting together to build something is going to happen. That could happen in a camp or even in any other kind of instruction. So how do I work around that? What creative solutions can I take to get people to work and think and react to each other that doesn't require physically being in the same room. And to me, that's the fun of, of online instruction is coming up with those challenges, those assignments. I love to do is just come up with assignments and that really work um, when you're not together in, in, in the room together. So um, is there some great example I can go find online, look at a course that's been built and then take, you know, that, example back with me would you do you um, any resources there or any suggestions yeah you know it depends what you're interested in because if it, wherever the topic you're going to find stuff so if you were to let's say you were interested in i don't know basket weaving you could google basket weaving online course and you'll find tons of resources lots of resources you'll find lots of courses some topics are more popular than others um so you're going to find a great variety and some are better than others. Um, you know, so you just have to evaluate for yourself how well it looks. And, and some, some systems allow you to sort of take a demo course to see what it's like. A lot of people are charging for these courses. I suspect now with the coronavirus crisis that a lot of organizations or even individuals are opening up things more for free. Yep. As we're seeing a lot of... Um, <clears throat> All businesses are extending their periods of time that you need to do something. Banks are being more forgiving about bad debt. Um, we're able to file our taxes in July instead of April and all that sort of stuff. And I think we're seeing a lot of, so you probably would see a lot more online activities that might be good free or very low cost, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, there's so many out there that there were before this. Now there's going to be a lot, lot more because people just realize this is the only way I'm going to get this stuff. So there'll be a lot more people trying to, to put what they know, their knowledge, their skills online. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really answer your question. I can't think about okay. one go-to place. If you go to Talent LMS or Teachable or, or other, there's other platforms like that, you will find they'll have a big catalog of stuff because they want people to come in and use it. They want people to use their platform. So you can go there and you'll see a lot of examples of how it's used and whatnot. Um, I t I'll tell you, one of the things that I've been impressed with is uh, Major League Baseball has uh, mm -hmm. uh, put on all these drills that young people can do in their home. Oh, nice. Cool. Outside. Right. In the backyard. They yeah. Equipment. They don't need equipment. They may be a towel right. or something like that. Right. And uh, right. that's been really impressive. So, you know, th I think those are great examples of, you know, again, if we go back to the summer camp example. Right. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to do a sport, softball, sure. baseball, 
might be. There might be online tools already. Right. Work on your skill set. Yeah. And, yeah. and even strategy, you know, baseball, you know, where's the play kind of thing. You can do scenarios, you know. Um, <clears throat> sure. Sports is also not, you know, great activity. Thing, things they can do alone. Right. Instance, yeah. Right. Excellent. All right. We're, we're almost up on time. I just wanted mm -hmm. to know if there were maybe any last minute uh, thoughts you could leave us with. Um, think out of the box, you know, really be creative about what you think you might be able to offer your audience that you might not have done otherwise because uh, uh, you didn't, you didn't have, you know, you had options to, besides meeting online. Um, I think there's all kinds of opportunities. And if anyone out there in your, in your listening audience, so to speak, has an idea, they want to run it by um, uh, uh, Harvest Development Group and send it on to me to give a, a reaction to, to see what they think about that idea. I'd be happy to do it. Um, so yeah, we, we need to support each other. So yeah, yeah, basically that's it. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. Again, I really enjoy always working with you. It's always been a pleasure. So. Dr. Scott, yeah, we go way back now. It's uh, yeah, so fun. Thank okay, you. thanks. This has been very a lot. This has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And it's a great service you're doing. So Thanks. And, and we will be uh, a resource. So again, if, you, if you're watching this uh, uh, video, live stream, or if you've watched others and you'd like to get uh, questions to the speakers, you can feel free to uh, email us at roots at harvest development grp.com and we can get those questions to the uh, different uh, subject matter experts that we've talked to and we'll get you uh, the support. So thanks a lot. My pleasure. Take care, Scott. Bye-bye.